Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now, this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley, and today we're discussing a very special movie, Steven Spielberg's first French movie, Le Fablement. First French movie? Le Fablement. <laughs> I have problem. It's like, it's like the Batmans. Do you say Fablemans? Fablemans, or yeah. Fablemans. Fablemans. It's a fake made up name. It can be whatever it wants. Get it? They're fable men. They, they, he's he's a fa- Sammy fable man telling fables. Yep, I got it. On the nose. Produced by, directed by, written by, and about Steven Spielberg. First screenwriting credit in over 20 years. No kidding. Did he write it in the sense that he lived it? Uh, no, he co-wrote the screenplay over COVID, over the, the shutdown or whatever with Tony Kushner. I mean, I guess if you're going to divulge a generation's old family secret, you might as well just go wide with it. Well, given that Spielberg is a pretty prolific director and has been around for decades, his parents were saying, Steve, when are you going to make that movie about us? Steve, you got to make that movie about us. And he's like, eh. And then his dad died uh, maybe four or five years ago. And then his mom died uh, a year before the pandemic. And he was like, all right, I'll make that movie now because it's a little bit disparaging. Really? I thought they came out pretty squeaky clean. Really? As far as infidelity and somewhat messy divorces go, right? they seem to have it pretty together. I mean, I definitely took sides in this movie. And like other movies we've discussed, I flip-flopped. My loyalties definitely shifted throughout the course of the movie. Like most recently in The Banshees of Inisherin. Exactly. So, are you in Camp Mitzi or Camp Bert? I don't know that I officially landed in any camp. All I know is that Paul Dano, as is, which is the correct pronunciation, by the way, I learned. What? Yeah. Not Paul Dano? No, nope. Paul Dano as Bert. His silence immediately kind of struck me. I was a little bit put off by it. Whereas Mitzi, the mom character, is definitely the dreamer. I called her uh, Mommily. <laughs> with with equally terrible hair, like tornado proof hair. But I kind of grew to hate Paul Dano's character in this movie. He was so passive and like, well, your mother and I have had troubles and I want her to be happy. It was very Eli. Very Eli. Under the surface. And I hated his passivity and his just like, uh, there's got to be a Jewish word for him. I mean, he's a smart guy and a tinkerer and stuff, but he was just so, hen like not henpecked even. He was just so, what's the word? Doormat. Well, yeah, but also the, the word where you like don't mind like watching your wife get boned by other dudes. Cuckold. Cuckold. That's what it is. Cuckold. Yeah. Dictionary. Cuckold. The husband of an f- unfaithful wife to make a cuckold of. Wow, good word, Wes. <laughs> and he's so frustrated. Just take an active role in your life, you douche. And then Mitzi went off the rails and boned Seth Rogen. And, you know, it's, it's, off screen. Yeah, but it's hard not to take Sammy's position where he feels the betrayal and starts to ignore her. And then her mom dies, which was like the realest scene in the movie, I think. And mm. like it actually made me feel for her, but it also began her spiral into madness. 
like the mm. the phone call mm-hmm. oh man and, and i'm pretty sure she went nuts and as she started to fall apart i was like this is kind of your own doing like i get that you're a dreamer and stuff happens to you and you realize its significance and you can justify it by saying that you're flighty and arty and not grounded and you live your life on a whim or whatever but also she was a mess and that made me not like her And thankfully, Benny, Uncle Benny, was out of the picture, uh, you know, after they moved. And so I couldn't hate him anymore. How could you hate Seth Rogen? Well, if he breaks your family up. He's all goofy and, like, trying to buy Sammy's love. Seth Rogen is kind of Seth Rogen. And he just changes beard length and hair length. And, like, dials up or down Jewishness. (laughs) I mean, this is, I think, perhaps more than Steven Spielberg's autobiography. It's a... It's a story of growing up Jewish in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Hard road to hoe unless you're saved by the magic of your own filmmaking. (laughs) It made me wonder. The vast majority of Spielberg's movies that are commercial hits are very clearly centered around Christmas. Like he hasn't made a Hanukkah movie. You're right. I wouldn't necessarily call Munich a Hanukkah movie (laughs) or Schindler's List a holiday movie. What, right. I don't know. Maybe there's some commercialization in a, like a family style Spielberg director releasing movies at Christmas time. It's just the way it is. I don't know. Maybe he was converted by that girl in the bedroom. Well, what, from what I understand, Hanukkah really isn't the highest of Jewish high holidays. It's just kind of become more part of public consciousness because it gets conflated with Christmas. Hit us up at our hotline or email to let us know about Hanukkah and Jewish holidays. <laughs> Also, it's just the good. It's just a good time. Christmas is also conflated with award season, and whether they're good or not, Spielberg's movies come out as awards contenders. Prestige Pictures, at least, is the only way that you can angle the Fablemans. Because boy, this movie came and went like nobody's business. The Fablemans is intensely personal, obviously, for Steven Spielberg. If you don't know and guess that this is based on his life or whatever, then I think you're missing like a key point of this movie. But he's in a little bit of a slump, and by a little bit, I mean a broad 20-year career slump. You know, he's got like a few peaks here and there, but nothing like Schindler's List, Jurassic Park-style fame and, and everything Saving preceding Private that. Ryan. So he puts out his little personal movie at a modest Spielberg budget of $40 million and and I think worldwide he got maybe $8 million back. Ooh. I mean, just Spielberg's name alone should command more than that. So I don't know how justified he is in telling his big bad family story. It was it was a little bit meandering. We're following Sammy a lot of the time, and, and I guess that makes sense. But if we weren't following Sammy as Spielberg and looking for the formative elements of his filmmaking career or his notoriety, you'd be like, this is meandering a little bit, right? It's not a given. There were some weird things because weird things happen in families. And the, the nail-cutting ambush scene... I Mm. thought was one Mm -hmm. of the most awkward ever on film. Mm. And then we got to the Christian conversion sex scene. (laughs) And I decided that was the most awkward scene in film history. Those stranger than fiction moments had to have been direct lifts from his real life, right? Yeah. The kid who played Sammy, along with Seth Rogen, because Spielberg was crying kind of a lot during the filming of this movie, apparently. And so the Sammy kid, the actor, would go to him and be like, hey, did this... You know, I want to get some motivation for the character. Did this really happen in your life? And Seth Rogen would be like, hey, Steve, this really happened? And 100% of the time, he'd say yes. And then the awkward dinner table scene happened, and I was—I decided that was the weirdest, most awkward scene in cinema history. The one where the mother insists that Benny is not their uncle. Oh, my goodness. Later on, I was thinking, was there some kind of subtext of Benny as one of their dads? Um, I'm not sure about specifically their dad, but it wasn't a surprise. I, but even I saw that coming. Like I was, he's around an awful lot, so much so that they had to clarify, probably in that scene, that Benny was not actually a part of the family because he's there all the time. It wasn't until after Mitzi makes her case for Bert bringing Benny along. Like, I was like, why is she so insistent that he help out his friend? And so until then, I didn't know. But then after that, it became pretty crystal clear. Yep. This had to have been cathartic for Spielberg. I guess I'm not surprised that he would be emotional throughout the filmmaking process. It does seem like he digs pretty deep. I was curious to know the man behind 
so many of my favorite cinematic moments. What are you going to do? I mean, he's 75 years old. In a way, it kind of felt a little swan songy for me. Like he was like saying, well, what story would I do I need to tell that I would kick myself if I didn't? That seems like end of career death movie Nell <laughs> to me. Ironically, ending on the, the embarkation of his movie career where he's like skipping all It's a Wonderful Lifestyle through the studio backlot. <laughs> yeah. Kind of going into this like blissful, inspired place of what cinema is meant to him. It just, it feels very, it portends like end times for for Spielberg and I'm not sure if that's like a, a subconscious thing or what it was a little sad he's the John Ford character all battle worn and eye patched oh and gosh. get the hell out of my office <laughs> uh, David Lynch steals the whole show obviously because this so closely mirrors real life or his experience Spielberg's experiences do you know anything about the David Lynch uh, cameo and what it took to get him on board no tell me so Laura Dern David Lynch not regular but she's been in a few and obviously been in a few Spielberg movies herself and most notably Jurassic Park he had to coerce Laura, Laura Dern to get her to coerce David Lynch and he was like all right I'll do it but I got to get my outfit two weeks early so I can live in it and get feel at home or whatever and and, and I, I need cheetos on set at all times so he had cheetos brought in and that's what it took to get him but multiple calls over you know a long time to get him to agree <laughs> and then after filming was done he's like may i may i take this what's left of the bag of cheetos home with me and they were like sure david lynch thank you for coming <laughs> wow man likes his cheetos yeah i'm wondering the, the cheetos puffs or like the flaming hot come on do you know that you can buy dorito dust <laughs> and like put it on stuff Did you know like you can make Dorito dust for a fraction of the price probably <laughs> I love me some Cheetos I think if I ever have a, a talent writer it'll be I need a safari jacket two weeks in advance <laughs> and unlimited flaming hot Cheetos right but if you're gonna do that role or whatever and he's gonna be weird and frankly it took until reading the movie poster to know that it was John Ford I get that he was a you know a, a, like a legendary western director and John Wayne and the searchers and all that good stuff I have no notion of who John Ford is because he existed a million years ago but if David Lynch had been like eating Cheetos while while uh, yelling at him <laughs> and had like orange finger dust like orange fingers during the scenes it wouldn't have been out of place for that character uh but i was gonna say that cheetos maybe not the best not, maybe not the best snack to have on a film set no it's like eating nutella no matter how careful you are <laughs> <laughs> something is gonna get marked oh man david lynch not even the craziest character in this movie definitely mitzi no rivaled by mitzi i mean R mitzi i don't know if mitzi was crazy i think mitzi was just more of a clown that was supposed to be charming and endearing, but it felt artificial to me. Really? So the, the, her performance felt like it was a wrong note, or that's who Mitzi was, and that theatricality of an artist, I guess, is what she was? It was, I mean, because we've talked before about the different styles of filmmaking and uh, actresses in the, you know, 50s and 60s that mom loves. It's a very different style of acting. There's like a wilting thing and like a strong and like, oh, Bruce, or whatever, you know? And in a way, she was emulating that. And I couldn't tell if it was awkward and out of place or remarkably spot on. In a way, like, don't get me wrong, the characters kind of bothered me because they were real people with real flaws, and we saw all their flaws displayed on screen. But Michelle Williams, is, I believe, is extraordinary. And if that was the sort of vibe of a 50s housewife who was an artist, uh, kind of a failed concert pianist or whatever, and she's grand and she's dreamy and, and probably emulating a lot of the movies that she's seen, I don't know, to, to channel that in a way that Michelle Williams definitely would have had to research that and put that on. If it's a very specific style of acting, I thought was great. She is the one of the best actresses of her generation with the worst hair consistently. <laughs> What's Michelle Williams' best movie? Um, probably the one that Spielberg saw her in that was, uh, you know, I mean, she was great in Brokeback Mountain. She was great in Blue Valentine specifically. He saw that movie, which is already probably 11, 12 years old, and saw her as the person to play his mother character in this movie that's been gestating for, you know, 
decades. I agree that there was a certain level of 50s affectation to her, to her role that brought a lot of authenticity to it. Michelle Williams' performance is more appropriate for Mitzi than perhaps Paul Dano's performances for Bert. But Bert is like a stereotypical kind of detached scientist type, right? Who maybe doesn't have the same emotional depth, capacity, or frankly availability. He's a 50s, 60s dad that has all of that incredible pressure, uh, pressure to support his family and also to succeed career-wise. What I'm trying to say is that both Mitzi and Bert were presented so sympathetically that I kind of couldn't hate either of them. I didn't really love or embrace any of them. Like kids, I completely like just disregard the kids in general. And even Sammy, we're not really talking about nearly as much as the heavyweights who play his parents. But so nice and real and family-like and kind of bland were his family that I, I, I forgot to hate Julia Butters. <laughs> I was, you know, I was really happy that one of the sisters finally had their moment. I mean, they were basically just wallpaper up until then. Right? They were just... I agree. Yeah, and just foils or supporting actors in Sammy's films. And so when Reggie Fableman finally gets her moment, I was like, oh, who's that? <laughs> Wait a second. Of course you have to give Julia Butters her monologue and her and her time to cry. Yeah. It was a sweet moment. Um, it was a sweet moment. And it was, a, it was an important moment for, I think, the kids to kind of come into their own, for, their, for them to have a, a conversation on their own that didn't revolve around filmmaking or their parents. Yeah. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. ElectroCast. There, there was a de decent balance of family stuff and the family, they were a real family. Like they were like together a lot and they were all up in each other's business. And it wasn't like, you know, go outside and be gone until the streetlights come on. But it was kind of like that. Like he, it was a balance of very much in the family dynamic. And we knew all the intricacies of the family life. And then we would go out and shoot the, the eight millimeter war films and stuff and be at school and all Karate Kid and Cobra Kai and stuff. <laughs> Cobra Kai. This is the second re second review in a row. Dude, Karate Kid all the way down to the beach scene with the bit with the big blonde bully. Beach scene. Yeah. Oh, at beat on at Ditch Day. Yeah, it was a very Karate Kid thing. But they seem like very hands on, involved, and present parents. They're at all of his film screenings. They're at all of his film shoots. You know, they're having family dinners, and and maybe that's just a contextual thing because our parents weren't like that. But they seem very involved. I mean, to clarify, mom had hearing difficulties and then dad later developed hearing difficulties. So there was a layer of removal to our like all in hands on family stuff. But they definitely came to our Millie Vanilli theater dance parties and stuff. <laughs> and we're all on board. And we never wanted for being able to try different stuff or go different places and basically do whatever we did with wanted to do with them bankrolling us. And they were present. And Mitzi was present until she peaced out and like went home with Uncle Benny. Went all lost daughter and was like, peace, my children. Right? Just like like somehow in a weird justification way, well, I'm an artist and that we do flighty stuff like that. But they made sure to show what good parents they were. Even poor beleaguered Bert, uh, you know, eventually he's like trying to dissuade him from, you know, a hundred dollars, Sammy, for a hobby. And then later he came around and was supportive or whatever. But Uncle Benny was also supportive. He's like, you're going to break your mom's heart. Here's an expensive movie camera. Go film. 
And you know how you can yeah. tell that Mitzi was a good mom? How? She cooked eggs in a cast iron pan. That's like Is that the right way to do that's it? That's domestic magic. Do you know how like nonstick cast iron pans aren't? If you can cook an yeah, egg very. in a cast iron pan and not have it stick, you're magical. But she was all struggling to get it out and all frustrated mm, serving still, them. Still, it worked. Just the balls to be able to do it lent to her air as a as a strong, willful mother. Maybe it was like a highly seasoned cast iron skillet. It would have to be, which only moms can pull off. After like years and years of usage. Exactly. Of dedication and care. Bert didn't come around. In his well, last scene with Sammy, he's like, I should have put my foot down years ago. But he's he's still trying to connect emotionally, and he's still present, is what I'm saying. He wasn't really never not present. He just didn't, he just was sort of hapless, I think is the word, with his gray slacks and, and little skinny tie or whatever. And it's just like, come on, dude, and like be aware. And he was more, he was aware, and, and ultimately when it came down to it, he was still, still present. Uh, Spielberg, apparently the dad took the brunt and blamed himself publicly to the family for the divorce and Spielberg and his dad were estranged. So it's a difficult relationship, Sammy and his dad. They reconciled and even Bert and, and Mitzi in real life, the real the real people, neither of whom were named Bert and or Mitzi, uh, became friends again. But Spielberg was estranged for his dad for like 15 years. Maybe not entirely, but they definitely had a strained relationship, which uh, which they got over. But the defo- the divorce, which I think Tony Kushner said that when Spielberg o- opened the floodgates, there was like six movies worth of stuff. But they knew that the divorce was going to was going to be the centerpiece of this movie. So what to add from Spielberg's childhood around the divorce being the primary focus of the movie because it affected him so profoundly, you know, was intensely personal. The divorce came very late in Sammy's life. He's only 16, what, 16 or 17 when he when he basically uncovers the infidelity. I guess that's pretty young, but he's he's nearly an adult when they divorce. And I wonder how that would affect how that affects children, you know, versus when it happens when they're really young. I'm going with young is better because it's like all traumas. You cry it out and you get, you get over it and you forget. Like, you know, a parent dies and it's like, when daddy coming home? He's not, no, daddy, I'm hungry, you know? And that's terrible and everything. But just psychologically, <laughs> you don't have the framework to be able to hang trauma. And I think that this was a really bad time. I think that age is a really tough time because you're just kind of trying to find your footing as an adult, he's trying to decide what he wants to do with his life. The family dynamic uh, and that framework kind of helps him develop his own strengths and passions, and and is a you know something to fall back on. And then when the, your foundation is, is compromised, it messes with you. And his filmmaking, despite the fact that that's how he ultimately caught his mom, was also the thing that saved him. That that made him have a new friend, and all that junk. And and. Saved him from getting his ass beat every day. But it messed with his ability to follow his dream or whatever. Because everything that he had used as a springboard was in jeopardy, was in question. Meaning the filming or his well, family? His family fell apart and he didn't want to make films anymore. Right. It just, it bleeds into everything. Or so I am told or I infer or glean. Having never been the kid of divorced parents. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot as a mom, how old is too young or how young is too young to know that your parents are people, right? This is a coming of age story where you learn, where our main character learns that his parents are people who have real needs, needs that are separate and apart from his needs and the family's needs. I mean, can you begrudge Mitzi for acknowledging her needs? I mean, isn't that basically what the crazy uncle was saying? To Sammy is that art's going to tear your family apart and it's going to become your obsession and nothing else will matter. Uncle Boris, who appears like a like a magician, drops knowledge and pieces out. (laughs) He was literally like a like a carny magician. (laughs) Right. He just showed up and then he was gone Uh, for Spielberg figuring out that your parents are people maybe in his mid 70s. But uh you know, he looks back on characters and sees who they were or whatever, and that's how it's represented here. 
uh, which I think was the strength, if there is a, a real strength of the Fablemans, is his ability to see his parents and all their quirks and dynamics as imperfect people, but interesting people nonetheless. I mean, Mitzi, not Bert, because Bert was, you know, like a boring tool. And you go, boo, Mitzi, find yourself, be happy or whatever. Go dancing away into the, into the, your, uh, you know, your marriage breaking relationship. But she died, Leah Adler, uh, died taking uncle benny's last name and had a restaurant in la that's still open and i guess found that happiness um both interesting people i suppose in their own regards just maybe not together which is the unfortunate truth i hear of life sometimes yeah i mean people talk about soulmates people talk less about being chronically mismatched and maybe that was their fate i can't um what i can't wrap my head around is what I take away from Bert, which is that love sometimes just isn't enough. Like it seemed like his approach with Mitzi, and now I'm just talking like love and relationship stuff, but it seemed like his approach was, I, if I just keep loving her, it'll work out. And he, he didn't, it, did, it seemed like he never stopped loving her. And it's sad. I mean, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like things were happening to him either. He tried hard. He was just in a different frequency. You know, I, I, I'm mean to him. Whenever I'm mean to him, he buys me a dress. It's like, ooh, like in a way that's sweet or whatever. And you're just kind of like, he's st good old steady Bert, but I need more. I'm going to go take this dress and, and seduce Uncle Benny with it. Hmm, come on. It's what happened. Was, was Mitzi trying to tell Sammy that they never did it? Was that mom speak for we never had sex? Yeah, that was a weird thing where you don't really like want to talk about your, you know, you talk about the birds and the bees and you tell your kids, but that doesn't mean you want to know about your parents' birds and or bees. <laughs> it's not a justification to a little kid. It's not like, oh, it's better because there was no penetration. It's like, it's has, not okay. Has mom told you her deep, dark secret? Uh, the one that you're going to air publicly on or whatever movies? The one that she says she's going to take to her grave? Uh, probably not, but I don't know. I'm assuming it has something to do. You're all scared. Look at you. Yeah, because it because mom's deep, dark secret based on the framing of this conversation likely has to do with her badge. And I want nothing to do with that topic. Ew, uh, you I don't said know, it. but you're making it weird. I'm just saying a, a woman's heart is an ocean of secrets. <sighs> <clears throat> and it's a and it's a little bit of an inappropriate burden to put that to put those secrets on your children. Dudes aren't meant to know the ocean of secrets. Is there one, though? Is there, like, a weird secret that you know that I don't? Maybe. <sighs> so is this Spielberg coming out of his slump? I don't think so. <laughs> Not commercially, unfortunately. Because, look, his movies over the last 20-plus years have been, some of them have been good movies. It's just you can't ride that crest forever. So he's still trucking along, and he's a legacy filmmaker, and we all love him, even though we scorn some of his movies. This movie didn't make a dime. But I remember when we talked uh, about uh, David Fincher and Mank and how specifically Mank was a movie made for David Fincher. Yep. All the authenticity, Spielberg's set director, got all the old Spielberg 8mm movies that he shot. He poured over them, dutifully recreated. Steven Spielberg said he the trippiest part was walking into his living room from 1954, recreated, like down to the line. Nobody knows that stuff. This movie was made exactly for Steven Spielberg. Nobody remembers any of these characters except for maybe the sisters who are still alive or some of the people that knew the parents. Otherwise, who is like, oh, I'm not sure that that's how it happened in Steven Spielberg's life, aside from the fact that none of these characters are named for his actual family except, strangely, Uncle Benny. Uncle Benny is the only one who's Uncle Benny. But uh, beyond him just making a crazy personal movie just for him, it has to be entertaining and compelling and interesting in its own right because it's not Spielberg and it doesn't have anything to do with Spielberg's professional film career as faithfully as they recreated his Escape to Nowhere war film where you step on the stick with that's loaded with dirt on the other end and it looks like an explosion as you're running, you know? It did all that <laughs> stuff. But it has to be a good family dynamic film that's interesting. And in that way, at least it was. Like, I wasn't bored by The Fablemans. It took 
have some weird turns as life tends to do and some unexpected outcomes in terms of the school bullying angle, I thought they were just going to drop it. And then the resolve was interesting and not at all what I expected. So I was carried along in that way. It, it definitely felt to me like a Steven Spielberg movie about a world uh, Jewishness time frame uh, life experience that I know nothing about, practically nothing about. Uh, but it was entertaining. And an all right movie? Yeah, an all right movie for sure. It was it was like a filmmaking version of one of our our you know most auspicious or or successful directors in history, and only Sp Steven Spielberg could have made the Fablemans. Right, and I don't begrudge him that. In a way, I feel like we can give Steven Spielberg this. The industry can give Steven Spielberg this. Audiences can give Steven Spielberg this for all he has given to us and to cinema. It's a little bit in self service, but to your point, it's not alienating. It's a relatable story and probably an important Jewish American story, and is uh, entertaining in its own kind of curious, very insular, limited kind of way. I'm happy for Steven Spielberg that he's written and directed basically this combo love letter to his to cinema and to his family. I guess itched, itched this itch that needed to be <laughs> scratched. <laughs> and can now move on. Uh, I'll join your all right with a good. And that's our discussion on The Fablemans, available in theaters and most likely coming to a streaming service near you. We've also discussed other Sp Steven Spielberg films, including Ready Player One, Jurassic Park, and Hook, all of which you can listen to at orwhatevermovies.com or wherever you get podcasts. If there's another Steven Spielberg film that you'd like for us, your hosts, Iris and Wes, to discuss, please let us know. 818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com at or whatever movies we hope you enjoy this review and we'll see you next time mile are you ready to record our promo for season two of the wanna bet podcast david have you ever seen a grown man naked miles we're not here to quote lines from airplane we're here to tell people that season two starts august 18th but i like airplane i know you do but wanna bet is a sports betting podcast each week we bet a thousand dollars on the nfl teams and games that we love well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year, you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric Acid. Hey, it's Tim from 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys, the comedy podcast you had no idea you needed. Join Ben, Jeff, and me as we continue our musical road trip back through the years and around the globe. See, just when you thought all white guys were like Joe Rogan, you come across three educators trying to remember when we were cool. 50 years of music with 50-year-old white guys. Electric acid.